The Nintendo Switch and PlayStation releases of Moonglow Bay come with a number of changes, some content that wasn't in the original release of the game. But perplexingly, I'm not entirely sure why they haven't taken that time to work on bugs instead. If you cross Stardew Valley with the tourist, then on paper you'd have Moonglow Bay. But is it a good destination for your next adventure, or should you continue to dredge the waters of the eShop for a better time? Well, my name's Mark Walker, cheers to the publisher for the review copy. Now, let's find out. First impressions are important with any game. Moonglow Bay then sets an interesting first impression. You're introduced to the character creator, or, or should I say the um, character selector. There are four different characters to choose from, and they're an interesting bunch. You've got the old bloke, and then three of the most nondescript characters I've ever seen. None of these characters appeal to me at all. Now, it's absolutely fine if you're creating a character with history around them that's then delivered to the player, but here it doesn't feel like Moonglow Bay knows exactly what it wants to do in that regard. Does it want you to create your own, or play as theirs, and both of those offerings aren't fleshed out enough. It feels more like a box ticking exercise. Now with that out of the way, the storyline essentially goes, in my case at least, that your wife has gone missing, she is presumed dead after three years, and your daughter arrives in Moonglow Bay to essentially help you get back on your feet. Now the old saying goes, something like, the high tide raises all ships, and that's what you'll do, you'll try and repair Moonglow Bay by helping all of its inhabitants through your own skill set which involves fishing, carrying out lots of different jobs, and even locating some legendary sea creatures, which on paper sounds amazing. Now gameplay-wise, all the proceedings take place from your house. It has elements of cooking, the aforementioned fishing, you can travel around on your boat, and there are loads of different upgrades. Now, let's start with your house. Your house is where you can cook any of the fish you've gathered. This is actually really good, and I enjoyed this quite a lot. And it is also worth mentioning that the entire game can be played in couch co-op, where you just hand a controller to your partner and they can jump right in. Now once you've gone to the kitchen and chosen what you want to cook, it gives you a nice step-by-step run in order of what you need to do. Grab it out of the fridge, go chop something up, maybe fry or boil. They're easy enough little mini games and they contribute towards the star rating of the dish at the end of your preparation. This is slightly different depending on which recipe you're currently cooking, and some of the steps are a little harder than others but overall it's quite manageable. You can cook multiple dishes, but the first issue arises when you need to repeat this step time and time again to refill your vending machine. These, by the way, can be purchased and placed outside your house and will automatically sell your produce. It just becomes tedious eventually, and being able to automate this would have been much more enjoyable earlier in the game. That way you can enjoy the process or just hand it off. It's particularly unusual because the game starts with your daughter coming to help you. She looks around at the state of your house and then walks off even if it did come with some monetary cost. Now, despite the pros and cons here, it can be quite enjoyable in small doses, and thankfully, it's a really quick and easy game to make money in. That vending machine will clock up up to a thousand in a day. I'm not entirely sure what the currency is, let's just say fishy tokens. And you'll need that cash, because that then takes us onto the fishing elements. Fishing takes a few different forms. You can chuck a lobster net in the water and come collect it later, throw out larger nets, which you just drag in over the fish and it collects them up, or well, there's old school fishing, where you'll unlock several different rods, a strong rod, poise, normal, and there's another that I've forgotten the name of. But honestly, they don't feel much different to each other at all. You can also choose the fishing lure and then the fishing bait. Again, there's just a vagueness about the effect that these have, and when you're using them, it really feels no different at all, other than the occasional different fish popping up. Now, every time you catch something, it shows you if it's the record weight, if it's a new breed. You do have breeds of fish, right? Yeah, I'm going with it. And then you can either keep it or throw it away. There doesn't seem to be an upper limit to the amount you can carry, which is pretty handy. And you'll trawl around in your little boat, unlocking different areas of the map, and there are little light biomes. You may encounter the occasional storm, but it's the bosses which uh, were the most unexpected element. In this regard, it reminded me a little bit of Dave the Diver. If you've played that, you'll encounter a couple of boss fights, and they're nice little distractions from the core experience, which it has to be said in that game is just a lot more fun. These fights may require you to upgrade your boat, which in turn needs money. You can change its armor, add on a lightning rod, and massively improve its engines. If you do get wrecked, you're gonna need a radio to call back to base and get yourself towed. The town of Moonglow Bay is, as I say, a bit of a state initially, and moving around it is interesting. It also highlights some of the other issues with the game, namely the 
uncanny ability to get stuck in most places. You see, the thing is, it lets you go places it probably shouldn't. So you jump down onto the beach and then you go to quickly hop back up and it runs against the edge. You find yourself stuck down a little alleyway or in a very small gap that you otherwise shouldn't be able to go to. Once you know these things, you can avoid them, but initially it's a bit jarring and feels quite janky. You'll also see characters stuck in their animations, just walking on the spot, but they aren't my biggest issues with the game. In any game that requires you to do multiple quests, the way these are handled is very important. In Moonglobe Bay, it gives you the standard list and it might show you many icons on the map. I'm sure you're noticing just by looking at these, I wonder what icons do what? Well, there's absolutely no way of knowing. If you hover over them, it doesn't bring you the quest name. The only way to actually determine where you're going is to disable tracking of every single objective other than the one that you want to go to. Even then, depending on the daytime, as there is a day-night cycle and people do go to bed, it can be really confusing as to where you're supposed to go as you'll arrive at a building with a quest marker you won't be able to go inside. And it gets frustrating as well because those markers aren't always exactly where you need to go. My next bugbear is what I like to call help. I've forgotten how to run indoors. For some unknown reason, you can't run or move any faster indoors than a snail's pace. It's so annoying. You'll be sprinting around town like Usain Bolt, walk through the doorway of a shop and yeah, your legs get heavy, you're obviously weary, and you can only like walk at this speed. It might seem minor, but trust me, it gets annoying when you have to just walk up to your bed, and that takes longer than the entire sprint across town. There's a notice board in this place as well where you can carry out smaller tasks for individuals, which is another thing we've seen done before. Games like Fae Farm. But do you know what those games do? They have the names of all the players on the map so you can navigate to them. If I need to go and help Bob, whose toothbrush has been stolen by a cat, well, I need to know where Bob is, don't I? The only way to do that here is either to memorize every single one of these characters or to run around like a headless chicken talking to each one. Which, look, it wouldn't be too bad, but they don't have their names above their heads. And then you've got the sticky dialogue. I've named that Sticky Dialogue. What I'm referring to there is the inability to leave dialogue. So you'll start a conversation, you know like in old point and click adventure games, you've made a mistake, oh I want to quickly back out. You can't do that here, you've got to hear that entire monologue again. And my word, does it get annoying. Especially when you're just trying to find Bob. That cat's probably brushing its teeth <laughs> in a completely different location. You get the picture. It's just annoying. It's doubly irritating in co-op because you accidentally talk to the other person. It's funny because despite all of this, Moonglow Bay still does have something for it, but it shoots itself in the foot every five minutes by throwing in a new glitch, or with one of the aforementioned just irritating mechanics. It'll give you a quest like catch a certain type of fish in a certain location, and after a hundred attempts, you haven't caught it, and oh wait, sorry, we forgot to tell you, you're actually gonna fish onto land for one time and one time only. Eeeh, yeah. No thanks. So many of these are very minor design issues that could be tweaked. Put the names of the characters above their heads. Tick. Have a directional arrow to your next quest. Tick. Allow for normal movement when inside buildings. Take some of the character models you've already made. Mix up the body parts and heads and let me choose or create my own character. Story and gameplay combined, they score 10 out of 20. The controls, they score 8 out of 20. Visually, Moonglow Bay uses a Marmite art style, which essentially means some people will love it and some will hate it. I mentioned it reminds me a little of The Tourist, which I thought was fantastic, and here it looks okay sometimes, but unfortunately it's the plethora of bugs and glitches which really drag it down. Firstly, there's the performance. There are times where it drops down to 25 to 26 FPS with relatively bad frame pacing, so you'll see it stutter around. Load times are actually fantastic, but it's the visual anomalies that are most apparent. After you've rested at night time, there's a very clear graphical corruption glitch that appears on screen. You will see characters stuck in their loops, unable to move, just spinning on the spot. And as I say, why add in any new content at all? If your game doesn't look run or act the way it should. It's a complete waste of time. When it's all running smoothly, which is um, not very often, there's certainly the potential here for something charming, but it just isn't the case for most of the time. The star of the show is the soundtrack from Lena Rain, who seemingly does not know how to make bad music. Uh, uh. 
she worked on Celeste, Minecraft, Guild Wars 2, and it keeps this game afloat, almost despite itself. While the visuals and performance are not good, scoring 8 out of 20, sound and audio is excellent, scoring 18 out of 20. Moonglow Bay retails at £22.49, and it's going to take you around 25 to 30 hours to finish it. While it sounds like I absolutely hate the game, I don't. It's just frustrating that so many very obvious design flaws have been allowed into the finished product. Now, one thing I will say is the publisher Coatsync, they are really good people, and in the past they've patched up their games. So I really do hope they can get onto Bunny Hug and just say, look, we well, gotta get this stuff fixed. You can't be buying a game that has people getting stuck in scenery, you getting stuck, constant performance issues, and other glitches. Now the design elements are obviously completely up to the developer, but adding the names of the players above their head, or at least giving the option for that, or an icon showing that they are the person relating to a certain quest, I don't know why you wouldn't do that. Hey ho, there we are, that's Moonglow Bay. In terms of value right now, I can't give it any more than 10 out of 20. So Moonglow Bay then, unfortunately, was taking on water from the beginning and they need to plug some holes to stop it from sinking. It gets a switch up score of 54%. I do hope the review was constructive and didn't come across as just purely negative because there is a lot to like here. It's unfortunately overshadowed by issues. Thanks to our Patreons, our members, all of you that enjoy the content and as always, for all things Switch all the time, keep it Switch up. Cheers guys. See ya!